After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. And Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. In those days, they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for he says the old is better. Amen. We're looking through uh, the Gospel of Luke and exploring that to see uh, how Jesus radically transforms our, our lives, uh, our thinking, our approach to other people, our approach to the world around us, our community. How do we live as we follow Jesus and, and what circumstances does he, does he put us in for his purposes and how does he want to work inside us? That's kind of where we're, where we're going, what we're, what we're looking at. Now, last week, uh, we looked at uh, Luke uh, chapter 5, in which Jesus uh, has an encounter with uh, Peter and, and it calls him to be a disciple, you know, to become a fisher of people instead of fish and all those kind of things. And we looked at that. And I've always wondered what happens after Peter or one of these other disciples says, okay, leave the family business, walk away from the boat, walk away from everything that you know that you're comfortable and that you're skilled at, and follow Jesus out into the world. What was that for you when, when you first said, okay, I'll get out of my boat and I'll, I'll say yes to, to Jesus and I'll follow him with my life? I always thought it was kind, would be a dramatic thing that... Um, you know, we're, if we're really with Jesus and we're walking along the lake and great things happen, you know. But when I looked at Luke's gospel, I found that immediately following Peter saying, all right, I'll leave the family business behind, <laughs> say goodbye to everybody and uh, follow you, he begins to have these encounters that are very... Um, undesirable in a lot of ways. He starts meeting a lot of people that are not really like him at all and that he wouldn't necessarily want to hang with. And, um, and I'm sure he's probably thinking, what did I get into? What, what in the world? And, and as immediately after following Jesus, it says uh, the very next thing is they run into a, a guy with leprosy uh, unclean, uh, they're seen, and contagious as can be, and outcast from all of society. You're not supposed to go anywhere near them. And this person drops down on his face in front of Jesus and said, if you want to, you know, you, you can heal me. And um, and I think Peter's going, what? What the? What? Things were better in the boat. <laughs> you know, this... This is a. Uh, this is not good. And then the very. And then the next one after that, they're talking in a house. Everything's nice. The house is crowded. Everything's great. And suddenly the roof gets torn apart, and these guys drop down a disabled friend right into the middle of the crowd at Jesus' feet. And Peter's going, "Okay, this is strike two, right here, right here. This is strike two. I don't know. Uh, what did I get into, right?" 
And you think, okay, well, that's good. And then it says Jesus walks by, and here's Levi, the tax collector, everybody hates because it would be like a, uh, a, a Jewish person conspiring uh, with the Nazis against their own people. You can picture that. Not beloved at the, at the community center. And, um, and, and, he, and he, said, he initiates it and says to Levi, come follow me. And Levi goes, okay. And then, and then he throws a party. And what do you do? Now, when your pagan friend, who's a cheat and a scoundrel and not somebody you like, who's, who's hurt you and taken advantage of you, when that person throws a party, who do they invite? Good church folk? They don't know any. <laughs> nice people in town that everybody respects? They don't know any of them either. So who do they invite? Another group of cheating scoundrels. Lying, conniving, fracking, fracking, biscuits are burning people, you know. That's who they invite. And so Jesus is there, and they're hooping it up, you know, and they're eating and drinking and partying, and everything's great, and Jesus is having a great time with all of Levi's scoundrel friends, and that creates issues. And Peter's going, that's strike three. This is, this is what did I do yesterday? I'm following Jesus. Where is he taking me? Right? And I felt that sometimes too. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to trust Christ with my life, you know, it sounded so glamorous when I was in college. You know, kind of radical and, you know, and I had the four spiritual laws, so I knew, you know, that my life would be perfectly symmetrical in order if I did this and there'd be no more chaos and I didn't know I had spiritual ADD at the time. But, um, but the thing is, I look back and I go, wow, just like the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has put me in situations that I would never have chosen on my own with people who are not like me. I mean, not, I'm not talking about you all, you know. <laughs> yeah, I am. But uh, <laughs> people who think differently. Who have other opinion, who have a different experience. And I realize that every single one of us has stuff. It's not that Jesus went and had these encounters with people who were outcast, unclean, uh, untrustworthy, all those things. It's that everybody has something like this in their life. Nobody is immune. And the lie is, in the, in the ordinary Christian world, the lie is, oh, we're not like that. We're different than everybody else. And those other people without Jesus have problems. Right? And if they could just meet the Lord, then they'd be like us, and they'd be problem and trouble and issue free. That's why I struggle with the church, you know, my whole life. Because I went, oh, wait, no, no, no. There's those who have real issues in their life and those who are in denial. There's only two kinds. <laughs> That's all. The people I'm jealous of, I just don't know that well. <clears throat> and, and the thing we need to understand is not how do we get away from troubled people and surround ourselves with people that would help us feel better about ourselves? That's not it. It's how do we allow Jesus to take us into situations where our real issues surface, and that's all right, because Christ is going to meet us there, and he's going to change our way of thinking, because something's happened in everybody's life that causes us to be the way we are, right? Now, I was reading a book, a Passionate Christians, and, and I, was, I was struck, there was a story, and I want to share this story with you. Uh, this is what it, what it said. Just down the street from us lives a lady and her two Scotty dogs, Whiskers and Thistle. Now, this is meaningful to me because Amy and, uh, and Annie just got a new dog this week. And I didn't get arrested on Christmas Eve giving back the dog that they found. So... <clears throat> Anyway, Whiskers and Thistle. You, you following here? You tracking with me? These two dogs have become my special friends in the last four years. The female dog, Thistle, is very outgoing and friendly and seems always eager to have a new relationship. Her brother, Whiskers, is shy and afraid of strangers. It took me three years to win his confidence so he will now allow me to pet him. 
One day I asked my neighbor about the difference between the brother and sister dogs. She said, I really don't know. I pressed her. Something must have happened to make him so different since they're from the same litter and raised in the same home. How could they be so different? What made them different? Well, after thinking a long time, she said, well, something unusual did happen to him. When he was riding in the car as a very small puppy, someone accidentally closed the electric window on his testicles. His injury required surgery. <laughs> I read that, and I thought of the church. <laughs> I can't help it. I thought of the church. <laughs> Here we are. Some outgoing, some a little more quiet. What happened? Like I said, everybody's got their story. You don't have to share it. <laughs> I can relate to this dog. <laughs> you know... Things happen, and we go, well, that was a long time ago. So what? Of course it was a long time ago. It's taken a long time to grow and fester and affect us in such a profound way. And Jesus comes to us and encounters us with our issues and invites us to a transformation. Now, I grew up in, you know, as you know, in West Africa as a little child in the jungle of Cameroon, next door to a leper colony. And uh, this was at the time where they were just starting to break through with a vaccination that might make them not so contagious. But I grew up, all my neighbors were lepers. And I never knew which ones had the vaccination and who didn't. So you didn't just jump on their lap, you know, as a kid. And, uh, but one of the things that we learned was that leprosy gives you no feeling of pain in your life. You do not feel pain. Of course, that's the problem because you can reach into the fire and grab the coals and hold them and it doesn't hurt at all. What a gift that is, right? Except you've just burned your hand through, right? Or you could break your ankle, and walk 20 miles, not hurt at all until you've worn the bones down to the ground, right? And so uh, this uh, leper confronts Jesus and throws himself on the ground and says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I am willing. I am willing. Be clean. And, and then he sends him off uh, to the priest uh, for ceremonial cleansing and things. And it never struck me before, but from that day on, that person experienced incredible pain for the first time. Never known pain. And now everything he did, all his habits, every way he had of being, hurt like crazy. Just like us. Right? So Jesus can give us what we ask for, but we may end up with some other issues. Right? Right? You know, I know, I've known single people all their life that, Lord, give me a spouse. And then they get one. Sometimes I've presided over their weddings. Sometimes I've warned them first and then presided over them. And, and, and then they come back to me and they say, can you get me a different one? <laughs> this one's a lemon, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we, got, they, we have lemon laws for cars. We ought to be able to get them for spouses, you know. And... Uh, But the point is, Jesus comes in, transforms him, brings him healing, brings him cleansing. His life is forever changed, but it is now filled with pain. That's the cost of being healed, right? And then you have um, uh, this uh, disabled man whose friends, good friends, who climb up on the roof and tear off some stranger's roof and... Uh, it was a rental, and uh, <laughs> drop him down in there, and uh, there's going to be implications for that healing. Now, it's interesting that Jesus didn't initiate the healing. Jesus initiated a forgiving of sins. 
That's what Jesus offered to him. And he only did the healing in the backstroke when people were complaining about forgiving sins. Then he goes, well, okay, so what's, what's worse? Forgiving sins or getting up and walk? Get up and walk. Oh, get out of here. Okay. And the guy did. And, and then, oh, okay, that too. And that forever changed, changed his life. And then you have Levi, this, this who, person who deserves to be hated, deserves to, to not be a part of what we're doing, is now invited into Jesus' circle. It's one of the disciples. And, and everybody's going, him? You know what he's done to our family? Do you know what, what's happened? And his friends? We're getting outnumbered by crooks. And Jesus said, it's all changing. Everything is changing. The way we think is changing. The way we see each other is changing. The way we live our lives is changing. It's radical change. And he said, you're not going to just patch this in. You're not going to take a new shirt and cut out the fabric on it so you have a big hole in your new shirt and stick it on an old shirt that's ratty and say, isn't that cute? It doesn't work. And yet, how many times have we, in our faith, said, okay, Lord, I've got my life figured out. I've got everything the way I want it. I've got everything. Everything's in order. I'm doing good. I just need you to help me with this one little area. Let me just put a patch of Jesus on my old tattered life. Wouldn't that be nice? Don't we do that? I do that. Over and over again. Lord, fix this little area and don't mess with that. I don't want a new life. I just want you to kind of tweak the one I got. Right? And Jesus goes, you know, I'm not really in the tweaking business because you're not going to like what I do anyway and it's not going to really fit into your control. He goes, Westfall, you got to change the way you're thinking. Oh, and I spent a lot of time getting this way. No, Westfall, you got to change the way you think because the way you think is not working so well. And I think people didn't understand. I don't think they understood Jesus then. I don't think through this whole chapter 5, all these encounters, which seem so kind of shockingly bizarre to me, and then he talks about, you know, you don't put that new wine in the old wine. It's going to burst. It's going to wreck everything. You end up with nothing. Don't just try and fit the new life in. It has to be new, radical change. We've got to think differently. One of, my, uh, one of my favorite um, psychiatrists, um, Archibald Hart from South Africa, and uh, he was really brilliant and um, wrote several books. But one of the things he said is that, um, I hadn't thought of this. I always thought, you know, the thoughts I have just kind of come to me. But he said, thinking is a learned habit. We learn how we think. So if you're thinking a certain way, you have certain thoughts, you have certain ways of approaching things, you've learned that. And you've gotten it down to a habit where you don't even have to think, think about it because you just do it that way. Now I, of course, assume everybody thinks the way I do. And then I met you all. Now I think nobody thinks like me. <laughs> That's okay. But um, we have to realize that Jesus can transform the way we think. And that then transforms uh, so much of our life. Uh, our chart also said that thinking comes before our feelings and our actions. Something happens, we think about. Um, in fact, there's a whole school of, of uh, psychology, a rational emotive therapy that, that comes from this point, that, that when we change the thinking, then it changes our emo emotional responses to things. It changes the way we behave. And I think that if we're going to talk about being radical Christians, in an ordinary world, we have got to deal with Jesus changing the way we think. And in, in Romans chapter 12, it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The transformation comes when we start thinking differently. So, I got a pen. So we have our thinking, right? The way we think. It's a smile button because we think pretty good. <laughs> That's really nice. Isn't that good? Okay. Um, and uh, 
our thoughts will shape how we see God, how we see Jesus, how we see God's involvement in our life, how we see Jesus engaging with us, how we see him transforming us, that is affected by our thoughts, right? We don't just have a spiritual experience without our brains connected to it. It also shapes our character. The things that happen to you, those indelible marks on you that, that make you the unique person that you are. How you think about what happens to you affects that character. You can have very similar experiences as someone else and their character is totally different than yours because they've processed it differently. And Jesus wants to shape our character and he'll do it as he, as he changes the way we think. And then, um, it affects our emotions. Now, I was one of those people who didn't enjoy my emotions so much, so I rationalized everything. I, I, how do you feel, John? Well, I think that what needs to happen is... See how I switched that from how do you feel to I think that... Mm, I was good at that. I was so good. Uh... John, what are you feeling now? Well, I think the best thing to do here would be, or if I was really good as a pastor, John, how do you feel about this? You know, I think what you need to do, <laughs> yeah, that's the pastor's gift, what you need to do, yeah. And it's so amazing to go, wait a minute, if Jesus is going to transform my thinking, that means he may affect my emotions. He may actually start to make me a feeling person or something like that. Or it may change my emotions. And then what we think determines our behaviors or our actions. It affects it. And you know, let's get another one in here. How about our attitudes? It shapes our attitudes. You know, we've talked before about, you know, everybody comes in with baggage. That's from the way we think. Now, what would happen if we allowed Jesus, not just to patch up our life here or there, you know, a little patch of Jesus on our life, but to actually transform our minds, change the way we think. Now, before Christmas, I don't know if, if any of you are here, you know, uh, many of you were, we talked about the, the, the three uh, wise men, you know, from the East who came, and, and, and what happened? How did that passage end? They went home a different way, right? They went home a new way. And, we, and one of the homework assignments was for, for us to take that up, and let's, let's go differently. The same thing happens with our minds. It's, a, it's the same principle. We've got to be thinking differently because adding a little bit of Jesus to our controlled life is not going to cut it. Trust me, I've been trying for years to do that. And it doesn't work. And it doesn't matter whether you've, you've had uh, you know, this happen or that, whether you got caught in some electric window in a car when you were a pup. It doesn't matter. Because we've all had that stuff happen. What matters is, will we allow Christ to transform our thinking and not just patch up our life? And, and uh, so, I've got a homework assignment for you. <laughs> and I appreciate those of you who wrote me notes with the other hand uh, uh, that... That doesn't make sense to you on the video, but we had a homework assignment about writing with the other hand, so sorry. Uh, but um, I would like for you to take a sheet of paper this week, and I would, I would like for you to um, write a letter to God in which you ask God to reveal to you What's going on in your thinking that affects you the way it does? And ask the Lord 
to help you think differently. Does that make sense? Specifically asked. Now, I'm not going to tell you what you need to do because that would be jumping in. I think God ought to do it himself, right? We don't have to protect his reputation. So, ask him, how can I think differently? Maybe in this situation that I'm struggling with right now, how do I need to think in this? And that'll affect how I feel, it'll affect what I do, it'll affect my character, who I am, all those things happen. I, just a, confessionally, you know, the prayer confession always happens in the sermon, it seems like here. But, um, you know, we're in a circumstance right now where uh, we have a, a huge mansion in, in Minnesota that's uh, in foreclosure. And uh, I've adjusted, you know, the price of freedom is $300,000. We, we figured that out. If we lose $300,000, we can walk away. But now it turns out that it's more complicated than that, and there's tenants who don't pay rent, and there's repairs that need to be done, and there's lawyers getting involved. And, and it's like, how I think about this is going to be huge and I am so wanting to handle it the Westfall way. I got to tell you, I wake up in the middle of the night. Well, okay, I'm going to teach this. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to, you know, and I've got it all worked out the Westfall way or the tough guy way or something. I'm going to manipulate that and I'm going to conjure up something here and I'm going to make that happen and I'll force them to do this and then I'll, and I'll come out ahead. And they, I have this so down. I'm like a genius. I'm, I'm the rain man of manipulating circumstances. <laughs> Judge Wapner, Judge Wapner, I, I am like there. And it dawned on me as I was preparing this message, because I always have to preach to myself, I hate that. <laughs> what if Jesus wants me to think about this differently? What if he, what if he wants me to totally think differently? It's hard to give up the old way, isn't it? And, you know, it's not even the money. It's now come down to a power. <laughs> I don't mind losing the money, but I don't want to lose power. Or at least inflict some pain on somebody, you know. And, uh, and Jesus is saying, you want to be well? You know? Yeah. You've got, you've got your leprosy and you've got your way of being and, and I can clean, cleanse you if that's what you want, but you're going to feel a whole bunch of stuff that you're not used to feeling. Is that okay? And I have to answer that question. Okay, Lord, I'll let you change my way of thinking. So I have to do the homework right along with you this week. Okay. All right, let's pray. Lord, we would follow you in a radical way. We don't want ordinary lives. Ordinary lives aren't living at all. But we need you so much. And so we pray that you would not just patch up little portions of our life, but that you would take us and make us new again. As you promised over and over in Scripture, make us new. And we need that. Change our way of thinking. And in doing that, change, change how we live. Change how we experience you. That's our need today. That's our need probably for quite a while. And we offer it in Jesus' name.